two miles of the school. Yeah, this would also involve reintroducing radical ideas like raincoats. <laughs> but I just want to suggest to you, the reason we're in the mess we're in is because we've adopted a whole series of habits that got us in the mess we're in. The third level, if you change personal behavior and you change the societal reinforcements, and one of the things I'd do if you have a big city is I'd look at a tax credit for grocery stores that are in the, that are in the inner city that offer, grow, that offer vegetables and fruit. And there is no national grocery store in Detroit today. So if the doctor says to you, you're in danger of becoming diabetic, you ought to eat fresh fruit and vegetables, if you're in the inner city, there's no place to go buy it. It no longer exists. And at the federal level, we ought to really rethink the food stamp program to optimize, to reward people for buying fresh food. I mean, these, these may sound crazy, but as you go through the process of trying to solve these things, you're not going to solve them without real change. Now, the third level is the system of delivering care. And I have a very simple model for you. Require people to post price and quality. If you don't require them to post price and quality, you're never going to fix the system. The morning they have to post price and quality, they start changing because it's embarrassing. There's, there's, in, in, in Milwaukee, there is uh, Governor, uh, I mean, uh, Congressman uh, Paul Ryan did a hearing last year. In Milwaukee, there are two hospitals within driving distance that charge $46,000 and $103,000 for the same procedure. But nobody knows it. And so the number one thing I would do to the system at large is price and quality. And then once you do the first three boxes, we can figure out financing. Because we'll take out so much money in the, in the current system, you could finance 100% insurance coverage, which I favor by voucherizing Medicaid, having a large federal tax credit for the working poor and small business, and candidly requiring people above $50,000 to buy insurance. I mean, this idea that somebody's just going to decide I need to buy my vacation home so I'm not going to insure myself because my neighbors will take care of me is exactly like welfare. And, and welfare for the, for the wealthy is no smarter an idea than the absence of work requirements was before we passed welfare reform. So that just gives you a framework. But I think this is, health is such a big part of your cost driver. It is such a big part of the quality of life. It is such a big part of our ability to compete in the world market. I think it's unavoidable. I think we have to have a commitment. I want to reframe the entire national debate on immigration. We need a commitment to legal immigration. This is a country that loves people who come here voluntarily. This is a country that wants people to come here voluntarily. There is no significant group of Americans who are opposed to immigration if it's legal. But we deeply want people to assimilate to become American, which means English as the official language of government is the minimum first step. That's, by the way, supported by 85% of the American people, including a majority of Hispanics. And this idea that English is the official language of government is a divisive issue is entirely a fantasy of the elites. But what the country also wants you to do, frankly, is focus on uh, enforcing the law for employers. The country doesn't want to deport people, just wants to make it impossible for them to get a job. It thinks at that point they'll figure out what to do. And, the country, and we have a whole package we're going to release on this data that, that is different than the national political mood, that is absolutely workable, uh, and, and finally, the country wants a renewed commitment to American history as the, basic, as the basic resource for understanding American civilization. I would argue you should not be able to graduate from high school without passing a test in American history, and you shouldn't be able to graduate from public colleges without passing a test in American history. And just say, you know, learning how to be an American is as important for people born here as it is for people who come here. I think we need a, a new contract with younger Americans. Uh, what I'm going to say now is, will give you a good indication why I didn't run this year for president, because uh, it's way too radical. But I want to say it, because I think it's true. Adolescence was a 19th century invention by the bourgeois to keep their kids out of shops and coal mines. It is now a failure. Adolescence has become a device which says, when you pass puberty, you're no longer a child, and you're not an adult. So you ought to watch MTV, and you ought to find role models who are two years older than you are. And it leads you to Paris Hilton. It is an insane, destructive cultural model. We have a methamphetamine crisis because these kids are bored to death. A crisis of people cutting themselves. What, what really radicalized me and made me decide to speak out so aggressively was a meeting we had in St. Louis with the Center for Health Transformation where two colleges came in as part of the group. 
and the two leaders in the colleges said casually that they had a lot of students who cut themselves. They weren't shocked by it. They said, oh yeah, we have this cutting problem. Now, ask yourself this. I mean, if we've generated a cultural contract where kids are in such psychic pain that they cut themselves the razor, and it's common enough that the administrators didn't even, th they didn't say, oh my God, we have this crisis. They said, oh yeah, people cut themselves. <coughs> it's sad. There's something, I mean, this is a profound underlying crisis of our culture. And then I'll tell you, I went, I went back to West Georgia University as it has now become, and uh, where I used to teach. And uh, we did part of our American Solutions uh, workshops. And so I got to teach a freshman class. And I went in about 60 kids, the youngest was 16. And I asked two questions that I've asked now for 30 years and I've always gotten the same answer. First, and you can, when you're out traveling around your state, try it out. First one I say to, them is, how many of you knew somebody in high school who cheated? Every hand goes up. In, in my entire career, I have never asked that question and not had every hand go up. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that the system of bureaucratic, certified boredom that we call education is so bad, it so lacks authority, that people routinely think cheating is reasonable. So you have a workforce and a citizenry who cheat their way through school, and who, by the way, think 70% is passing, which if you try that as a cashier at a McDonald's, will get you fired in the first hour. I mean, it's, a totally, it's a totally absurd, isolated model of destructive behavior. And then the second question I've been asking for the last 30 years, which is, if we offered you a bonus, remember, values, vision, metrics. If we offered you a bonus and said, if you could pass all your high school requirements in three years, we'll give you a bonus for saving us the cost of the fourth year. How many of you could have gotten through in three years? Every hand goes up. We're paying for the most expensive babysitting program for, kid, for teenagers in the world. I then said, how many of you could get through in two years? Half the hands went up. This has always happened to me for 30 years. I finally said, how many of you could get through in one year? Kid at the back of the room yells, how big is the bonus? <laughs> now, I happened to, after doing this recently, with these two events in my head, the cutting incident and the West Georgia, I happened to be in a, in a briefing by David Barton at Wall Builders, who has a, does a brilliant briefing on uh, the origins of the American system and the founding fathers. And he pointed out that the average age of entering Princeton in the Revolutionary War period was 13. And the Franklin left Boston and went to his uncles in Philadelphia to be apprenticed at 13. Because in an earlier world, you were either a child or you were a young adult. If you were a young adult, you were supposed to learn from adults. You were not supposed to learn. You didn't have 13-year-olds mimicking 15-year-olds. And I just want to suggest to you, we need experiments, particularly take the poorest, take the three places in your state that have the highest dropout rate. Remember that if you're an African-American male and you drop out, you face a 73% unemployment rate in your 20s and a 60% likelihood of going to jail. So take the three neighborhoods where you're more likely to produce prisoners than college graduates. What are you risking if you offer a new contract? What are you risking if you go in there and say, we'd like life to be vibrant, engaged, and, and I suggest strongly Jim Lehrer's work on engagement theory, or the Gallup polls work on engagement theory. I'd, li I'd like you to be invested in life. I'd like you to be earning a living. I'd like you to be able to inventing the future. I'd like you to be excited every morning. And if you take that, I said to Lair after I took his, his course on, on health, and I said, and it's all about engagement. The people, people who are engaged, and all of you are engaged, whether you're a professional athlete, or you're a business leader, or you're a military leader, you're a government leader, you get up every day, you're excited about what you're doing, you're totally invested, you're, by the way, you're healthier. People who are invested in what they're doing are healthier. I mean, Haley and I have both faced a challenge all our life that we have not quite looked the way we should because we both happen to like to eat too much. <laughs> but we're healthier because we love what we're doing so much that it carries us forward. Hope I didn't offend you. Marsh is probably going to kill me now. But anyhow. And yet, I said, so I said to Larry, what's your image of schools? He said, they, said they are engines.